In this second episode of Lessons from Church History, we consider the consequences of Augustine of Hippo's actions against the Donatists. And to do that, we need to be reminded what the Donatist controversy was. It came about as a result of the persecutions of the church that took place at the close of the third century. We covered this back in episode 13, it was titled The Lapsed Dance. Official persecution of Christians under the Roman Empire tended to be sporadic and regional. Emperors might call for a general clampdown on the followers of Jesus, but they left it to the regional governors to decide how strictly they would enforce it. Some of those governors ignored the policy because they knew Christians to be good citizens, an asset to the realm. Others, for whatever reason, used the emperor's command as an excuse to brutalize the church. That changed with Diocletian at the end of the third century. At the urging of his co-emperor Galerius, Diocletian pressed for an empire-wide, harsh crackdown on the Christians. Their leaders and scriptures were special targets. During this time, not a few bishops and elders of the church caved to the pressure and recanted their faith. Others offered up precious manuscripts of scripture to be burnt. When Constantine came to the throne a short time later and issued an official revocation of persecution, the church was faced with the challenge of what to do with those bishops who'd shamefully recanted their faith. Their cowardice all the worse as it was set against the backdrop of the large number of everyday believers, including teenage girls and young mothers like Felicitas and Perpetua, who'd bravely faced the wild beasts in the arena, or burned at the stake, or had a heavy stone tied around their feet and then dropped in a river. The haters came up with ingenious means to dispose of the Jesus people. Now, some of those bishops who recanted, repented their recanting, and then politely asked if maybe, perchance, they could get their job back. In Europe, the general policy was to treat each bishop case by case because every situation was unique and they were handled that way. One bishop might be restored while another was not, depending on how the judge grievousness of their temporary apostasy. A bishop who recanted publicly and profusely while merely being threatened with torment was deemed more culpable than the bishop who recanted while delirious from long torture and real pain. History tells us that many church leaders bore the marks of their torture at the hands of officials for years after as they ministered under the new regime. So imagine going to your church next Sunday to see that your pastor is missing an eye and deep scars on his arm from torture that he endured years ago for being a Christian. It would tend to make your confidence in his sincerity of faith a little more sure and might add a little gravitas to the words that you heard him speak. Now, while it was the policy in Europe to try lapsed bishops on a case-by-case -case basis, it was different in North Africa, where we'll just say the standards of morality were a bit higher. It was in Egypt, you'll remember, that the Desert Fathers began. The life of the ascetic hermit was still valued. The church there was not inclined to restore lapsed but repentant bishops. Now, this faction was led by a bishop named Donatus. This policy came into conflict with Rome that had the lead in the Western Church. A long brewing tension between the churches of Europe led by Rome and the churches in North Africa led by Carthage got even more tense when Rome declared North Africa to be an official error. But the heart of the Donatist controversy wasn't over whether or not lapsed bishops, tradiatores as they were called, could be restored to their office. The point of deepest contention was over whether or not the baptisms and communion services lapsed bishops had performed counted. Donatus said that if Jimmy was baptized by a lapsed bishop, it was as if Jimmy had never been baptized at all because that bishop was not actually authorized to baptize. Same with communion. The best a lapsed bishop could do was give someone a snack. And now we get to Augustine's part in all of this. When he became bishop at Hippo in North Africa, the Donatists still thrived there, in some places forming the majority. Augustine supported the Roman position against them. He argued against the Donatists, saying that, according to Jesus' parable of the wheat and tares, the church was a mixed multitude, holding both the lost and the saved. Now, I have to say that I'm at a loss to see how that justified allowing part-time apostates to regain leadership positions in the church. 
Let's consider that in light of some of the scandals that we've seen in recent times. Should a pastor who is caught in adultery be allowed to continue as a pastor just because he breaks up with his mistress? An elder whose anger regularly gets the better of him so that he gets into fights? Isn't he disqualified to continue as an elder? We might better ask, how did he ever become one in the first place? Now, don't forget that the term bishop that we see so often in the writing of the early church fathers was synonymous with the word that we use today for pastor. In the New Testament, the words elder, pastor, bishop all refer to the same office. Elder refers to the mature character of the leader. Bishops or episkopos, overseers, refers to the authority given to them by God to lead. Well, the word pastor is the same word as shepherd and describes what he does. He leads, feeds, and protects God's flock. The criteria for these elders is given by the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And here's the list from the Timothy passage. We read, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. Now, it seems to me that the policy adopted by the churches of Europe was a more biblically sound approach than the Donatists' just blanket rejection. But at the same time, one wonders how many lapsed bishops were reinstalled in their churches just because they were likable or maybe gifted speakers. We don't know, because no account of them was made. But knowing human nature, surely some of those tradiatories climbed back into their role as pastor who were no longer, as Paul says, blameless. How many had utterly lost their testimony among outsiders? But for Augustine, the issue wasn't so much that these lapsed priests and bishops were allowed back into their roles. It was more the question of whether or not their religious service held any efficacy for those that they were served by. The baptisms that they performed were still legit, as was the communion they served. Because it wasn't the faith of the officiant that matters, it was the faith of the one being baptized and taking communion. Augustine differed from the Donatists on the validity of baptism and communion served by lapsed priests. Donatists claimed an apostate had lost authority to administer these rites. But Augustine said that the moral and spiritual standing of a pastor wasn't important, only that he be aware that he bestowed God's grace on others by baptizing and serving communion. While no doubt many of us would agree that it isn't the moral excellence of the officiating minister that determines the value of communion and baptism, what some will find difficult is the idea that a special grace is communicated by a priest or pastor through these rituals. This brings up a much later controversy that will surface during the Reformation. Do the sacraments convey grace, or are they meant as memorials that point to a historical event that we renew faith by? Now, note that I did not say they merely were memorials, for that goes too far and misrepresents the position of the Reformers. That's a subject for a much later episode. Augustine's argument at this point laid the foundation for the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine that an ordained priest becomes the channel of grace to church members. And the next stop on that train is sacramentalism and sacerdotalism. The Donatists gained a major advantage in 387 when a rebel leader managed to form a quasi-independent regime in North Africa. Now, they didn't need to worry about imperial meddling in church affairs since the new ruler supported them. When Augustine settled into Hippo as bishop there, he immediately went to work refuting the theology of the Donatists, seeing it as a major threat and challenge to the Catholic doctrine. The Donatists' luck ran out in 398 when the Roman Empire reasserted control over the region, and now it was the Catholics who would be calling the shots, backed up by imperial power. 
Augustine had been preparing for this. He joined with the statesman Bishop Aurelius of Carthage to attempt negotiations with the Donatists. But the divide between the two camps was too wide and too deep. When the Donatists remained determined to stick by their long-held beliefs, the contest degenerated into violence. A frustrated Augustine supported harsh measures against the Donatists by misapplying Luke chapter 14, verse 23. In the parable of the banquet, the host said, compel them to come in. Augustine used this to justify forcing opponents to comply with church doctrine. This seems an odd application of a passage that really is self-explanatory. The servants of the host didn't go out and beat people, driving them with whips to come into the banquet. Yet that is what Augustine now advocated in compelling the Donatists to forsake their obstinacy and just agree to sit at Rome's table. The lingering tragedy of this episode in Augustine's life is that the course he took with the Donatists became the template for later church leaders during the Middle Ages and the Reformation to force compliance with church dictates. Augustine was held in such high regard that the attitude of many churchmen was that if he said or did it, it was the pattern and the path that God wanted all of his servants to walk. Yet if this was how the work of God is done, then why does Jesus not mark out his own meekness as an example that his people are to follow? In Matthew 11, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us to follow. He doesn't force or make us follow. He offers a yoke, but we must step into it. He doesn't slam it down on our necks. Augustine, as brilliant as he was, was simply wrong in sanctioning the use of state power to force compliance to church dictates.